Good afternoon to you. Mark Seth Track.com here. It's Friday, the 20th of May, 2022, and the tropics are nice and quiet. I'll show you a little bit about what's happening out there. The big story and an educational opportunity here is the Saharan air layer. We're going to hear a lot about it, I guarantee it, especially as we get between now and, uh, let's say, mid to late August. I bet you're going to hear about it quite a bit. So I thought, hey, what is it? And uh, how do we track it? What does it do? How can it change the outcomes of uh, tropical waves and so forth and so on? So we're going to cover the Saharan air layer today in the bulk of today's update. Real quick, though, in the tropics, nothing in the Atlantic over the next two and five days and or either way. And the same is true for the Pacific. Five days, two days, nothing. Forget about it. Pretty active intertropical convergence. That's terrible. You can't even see that. That's uh, let's use the color white and let's make that line thicker. There we go. Pretty active intertropical convergence zone in the eastern Pacific. That is the area where the trades from the northern and southern hemisphere collide. Convergence meaning they're coming together. The air goes up and you get some shower and thunderstorm activities. Kind of like a grapevine or whatever you want to call it. And occasionally something will ripen along that vine, if you will. You see that analogy there. And you can get development, but we're not going to have that anytime soon. So let's do some education. The Saharan air layer, what is it? Why does NOAA track it? This is a great tutorial here uh, that I want to show you. I'll put a link to this in today's video discussion in the description. Uh, wonderful satellite picture here showing the Saharan air layer itself, Saharan dust coming off Africa in a satellite picture from our wonderful technology that we have as a, as a human species. Pretty amazing. Um, this is from June 2020, and this kind of goes to my point a little bit. We all remember 2020, hurricane-wise, you know, everything else, uh, how that turned out. And so people were looking at this in June, and I think this is the one that people were calling like Godzilla, you know, the media, the media, whatever that means, social media especially, likes to hype things up and put terms on them that make them bigger than life. This was some massive outbreak. I think this is the one. It was like the Godzilla Saharan air outbreak or whatever. And it swept across, you know, the entire Caribbean. Uh, there was, we showed even images from our cameras down in St. John and St. Thomas. Brent, our partner down in St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands, flew his drone across the harbor there. Cruise Bay, actually the bay. And it was all red. It looked like Mars. It was very dramatic. And, you know, people are like, well, that'll be it for the hurricane season. All right, well, just see 2020. That's all I have to say. I don't even mean to smile about it because it was pretty rough. Uh, but the Saharan air layer does not stop an entire hurricane season. It can put a lid on things temporarily. Um, just a little reminder there as we see that picture. So as we get into the 2022 season, this is perfect. The way this blog was written up, so I thought I would show it to you. We'll go over a few highlights of it. Uh, not the entire thing, obviously. We want to make this brief today. Uh, but we'll no doubt hear a lot about the Saharan air layer. It is a mass of very dry, dusty air that forms over the Sahara Desert during the late spring, summer, and early fall. It can travel and impact locations thousands of miles away. That's important uh, from its African origins, which is one reason why NOAA uses the lofty perspective of its satellites. Good play on words there to track it. So they sat down with uh, Dr. Jason Dunyon. I believe I've met Jason once or twice in my career down at the University of Miami Hurricane. Uh, he works at AOML, the Atlantic Operational, or I'm sorry, Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Lab down at the University of Miami. So the NESDIS folks, folks asked him what uh, causes the Saharan air layer to form. Jason says that the style outbreaks can form when ripples in the lower to mid atmosphere called tropical waves, track along the southern edge of the Sahara Desert and loft vast amounts of dust into the atmosphere. As the sal crosses the Atlantic, it usually occupies a two to two and a half mile thick layer of the atmosphere, which it's with its base starting at about a mile above the surface. So at about 850 millibars or so, remember we talk about that a lot, about 5,000 feet or a mile is 5280, okay, whatever. Uh, so about 850 millibars, plus or minus, that's the beginning of the Saharan air layer. So it's this two and a half mile, sometimes two and a half mile thick blanket. 
You saw that satellite picture there, and it travels across. It's dry. You know, they, he talks about that. <clears throat> it's dry. It's warm. And the strong winds that are associated with it have been known and shown to suppress tropical cyclone formation and intensification. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but I wanted to introduce it to you and encourage you to read this article yourself and yourselves, plural. So share this with friends and family on your Facebook groups and whatever. Seriously, it's a great article. There's a picture of Dr. Dunyon um, and, and read it. You know, there's good Q&A back and forth. This will give you something to do today. All right. So we can see it in different satellite views. It's here in this view, even though you can't necessarily see it. It's right here. The current Saharan air layer. It's not as prevalent as the beautiful color picture I showed you as we started this. And by the way, you can also see strong upper level winds here, strong upper level winds here, that convection percolating in the southeastern Pacific, but nothing that is coalescing to give us any troubles anytime soon. Now we switch over to the true color satellite view. These are just different bandwidths and filters and whatever that we can use from the powerful GO-16 satellite way up there in geostationary orbit uh, to see different parts of the atmosphere and how they work. So this is sort of like it would look if you were really out there. There's probably some simulation involved here, but um, it's basically a visible true color picture. And right in here, you can see some of that dust very clearly, you know, even on the uh, the video here that you're watching. It's there. It came off Africa, lofted by the African easterly jet, and it's really, really causing a lot of stable air. Look at all these little low clouds in here, these little speckles. That's all absolutely a telltale sign of stability. Warm air over warm air does not give you stability, instability. It gives you stability and that doesn't work for convection. You understand you have to have cold air over warm air for the warm air to be buoyant into and that's how you get instability and this is just it isn't happening. It's not happening. So in terms of getting deep convection now on the far western edge of it the Saharan air layer has not quite penetrated yet. There is a flare up of showers and thunderstorms associated with the Central American gyre that's taken shape. The GFS was right on part of the ingredients there. You know, it kind of botched the outcome, you know, kind of rewriting the movie or the book, so to speak. You know, it had certain parts right, sort of faking it to the end. Uh, there is convection and there is a Central American gyre down here, but the Saharan air layer, maybe it didn't quote know that that was going to be coming in. And this dry air will really limit uh, convection as that article talks about. So. Uh, other ways we can look at it, this is the same GOES-16 satellite, but it's analyzed to see, uh, air quotes there, to see dry air in this case, and dusty air, and boy, I mean, it's just forget it. Look at all of this area of the Atlantic. You're not going to have any development. This is just dry air, not associated with the Saharan air layer, but just dry, low precipitable water air in the western Gulf. No hurricanes anytime soon when you see this, that is for sure. And I thought I would reference, uh, I saw this tweet, this was kind of cool. The heck? Everything going crazy behind me. Um, could get some Saharan air here. But I thought this was interesting, this is from Kirk Mellish. You know, how, how have I ever referenced somebody from radio in one of my updates? I don't think so. It's usually somebody on social media, maybe somebody on the Weather Channel or something, or... Uh, another, you know, like you know, we reference Jack Sillen or Ben Knoll or whatever. But anyway, I've, I've heard Kirk Mellish as I've driven through the Atlanta metro area on WSB. And I saw this tweet because I was looking for Saharan air layer related content because I wanted this, the, the graphic that gets put out. Uh, the NASA Dust Extinction Aerosol Optics, Optical Thickness. Hey, it's just a fancy way of saying, where's the dust going? And what's the forecast for it? So this is valid uh, about 71 hours out, all right? And Kirk is forecasting for Atlanta, which is over here. And his tweet was saying we could get some dust all the way that came over from Africa. This is valid over the weekend, uh, Sunday, uh, the 22nd of May. So a couple of days out, right, from when Kirk tweeted this tweet. You understand? So there it is. Look at that. From Africa all the way across the Atlantic 
It kind of gets swept up into the circulation patterns of the western part of the basin. And there you go. Rich red sunsets if it's not stormy and cloudy. Um, and dust, maybe even on your car. The Saharan air layer, a very interesting and important part of each and every hurricane season. All right, moving on along. Real quick, lower 48 weather. Look at this. Pretty active. Got some severe weather over here in the northeast part of the United States. And as such, some watches and warnings, even some heat advisories. It's even hot where I am down in Wilmington in the mid to upper 90s, depending on which parking lot you're standing in. Critical fire weather here in the pink. Yuck. That's been a huge problem. I'm going to have to start covering that more and, and shine a light on it, literally. Uh, and we'll do that as our Patreon support grows. Meanwhile, winter trying to remind us that it'll come back eventually. And even some severe weather in the upper peninsula region there of Michigan. So let's see what it looks like here on our map. Hey, look, this is Colorado Springs area in the Black Forest It was uh, area. It was snowing earlier. Let's see. You can see just a little bit. Yes, that is snow. Now, granted, this camera site over at Scott's Place, uh, Pro Ranch Welding, he hosts this camera for us. It's several thousand feet up. I'm going to guess around seven or so, if memory serves. So, you know, it's a little different than being down on the valley floor or whatever. Uh, meanwhile, up in Parker, our other supporter and assistant and just all-around great guy and solid driver, too, thank goodness, Matt. Um, and he and, and Scott are good friends. They helped to put some of our equipment together. Anyway, it's snowing in Parker. So, yes, winter has made a comeback, and that's what this map is showing. Look at these winter storm warnings here as we zoom in. Um, and they need it. Uh, this is really actually a great thing to see. You know, some people, they're tired of it. They don't want to see any snow or whatever, and it does cause travel problems. There are impacts with it, but you guys need the moisture out there like nobody's business so I'm, I'm glad to see this any snowpack even you know late may you'll take it so this is not uh, a bad thing when all is said and done that area is really hurting for moisture all right uh moving on along next few days this is the gfs 850 millibar for the next five days this is the start of the loop here you can see the stream of nothing it's basically yes some vorticity down here or energy or spin in the atmosphere, you can see uh, the Central American gyre trying to do its thing down here, but nothing gets consolidated and uh, closed off or whatever, so nothing to worry about from the tropics down in the Western Caribbean. I think this is going to be, finally, I mean, we have 11 days to go, 10 to 11 days to go, and May is over. We might actually break the streak of, not, uh, of having a named storm before June 1st. I don't think it's going to happen this year. We'll see. It's not in the cards yet, but, you know, that's more than five days away. It could still happen, but there's just not a big signal for it. I think we're going to have a regular busy hurricane season with deep tropical development, development where it should be, when it should be, probably often June through November. I just think it's going to be very busy, and we'll get to that later. You've heard the forecasts, and uh, we'll eventually start watching that stuff really closely. All right, uh, severe weather. Limited, but in some impactful areas in terms of populations, you know, Jersey, Pennsylvania, a lot of people live up there and enhance risk of severe weather today. Uh, the tornado threat, 5%, and that also includes the upper peninsula of Michigan. The wind threat is there as well, especially in eastern Pennsylvania, western New Jersey. And then the hail threat is most um, probable, I guess you would say, in the upper peninsula of Michigan. What about tomorrow heading into Saturday? large area of a slight risk that's that's getting it right there that's huge so you know pay attention keep those NOAA weather radios your phone handy whatever you know you get those thunderstorms popping up you got to be ready the hail threat tornado threat etc not too bad overall two percent tornado the wind damage that's straight line winds you know these downbursts that come out and that can cause problems at airports too so your flight might get delayed you know these weather events do have impacts even if they are not giant news making events and even some general thunderstorm activity in the Pacific Northwest. Finally, day three, Sunday, limited to New England, a little bit of a risk down in parts of the Mississippi Valley, and then just a little bit of instability up here in the Rockies. So pay attention to that, especially if you're doing some hiking. Could get some high base thunderstorms with some lightning strikes. Then 
Days four through eight, not enough really showing up in the guidance of any significance to trigger a 15% or greater outlook, but I think it's coming. The MJO and other factors, these Kelvin waves, upward motion, is all headed towards the western hemisphere, the Atlantic Basin, lower 48, the severe weather potential. I believe as we get to the end of the month, into the first part of June, we'll ramp back up, and I hope to get back out there. We've got a couple of exciting things to do in Tornado Alley, practicing some things, you know, just seeing where we fit into that whole narrative out there. All right. Um, oh, yeah, and that I forgot I had this. Let me just prove it to you. So lower 48, uh, this is the trough today that's causing the, thought I was almost done, causing the snow in the Denver area, west of Denver, south of Denver, whatever. But watch what happens over the next several days, and I am going to go out farther into time, further into time, whatever it is, to show you. Look at this energy. This is out at about 138 hours. This is next week. and some energy coming in through the Midwest. And then another piece of energy there. This is towards the end of May. That right there could be interesting, especially out in front of it. I'm telling you, I think we're going to have more severe weather because the Gulf is still open for business down here, that there's no hurricanes robbing all the moisture. So the severe weather threat, I think, will continue. Now, this is exciting. I am going to make public the next episode of the Hurricane Highway, our crowdfunded original series that I produce in conjunction with several fantastic people that helped to put all this stuff together. This is our showcase, our own television style series um, that I produce, you know, on this very laptop right here. We're actually getting a new computer in the next few weeks that I'll be able to work much faster from, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that later. But yes, it is the next episode. It's part one because I had to break it into two parts. Laura was a beast. You guys remember that? So part one will be publicly available this afternoon uh, in just a couple of hours. You see the URL there if you want to type that in yourself and go ahead and watch it. That's fine. It'll be publicly available. You're going to like it. And then part two next Friday, I'll put that out as well. And um, I think you're going to really like what we did there back in uh, that Laura episode. Very challenging. Uh, we lost some equipment. It was tough. But really, really good stories there to show you. Uh, check it out. It'll be publicly available on YouTube by this evening. All right. All right. And, of course, if you want to become part of it, get on Patreon. Patreon.com or the Patreon app. Search Hurricane Track. You know, the logo. It's right there. Uh, and uh, you can, you know, get your name in the credits one day if you become a long-term supporter. Just like people support public radio, that's kind of like what we do. All right. You guys have a good weekend. I am going to be not off, but no reason for an update tomorrow or Sunday. I'll do some family stuff and some other work-related things. And you guys can watch the Hurricane Highway Episode 6, right? Right. But I'll be back on Monday. All right? So have a good weekend. Stay safe out there. As always, thanks for tuning in and giving me a part of your day. I'm Mark Suddeth, Hurricane Track. We'll do this again on Monday.